Wow, you're here. You're here. <laughs> um, I got to show you this. There's, there's a picture taken. You may have seen it on the way in today. Look, look at this. Look at this picture. Those of you watching on our line right now feel like wusses, don't you? So you just feel like real wusses. Uh, that's my son-in-law who is serving today, and uh, he came in on his motorcycle, and um, I don't know whether to be angry at him or proud of him, so proud of him, but uh, David, you will be getting a ride home, okay? He was, he was here before the snow actually hit. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you saw Thursday cover story of the Dayton Daily News was interesting. Um, the, the title of the article, as it appeared on the paper, was as sports gambling grows, so does Dayton coaches anger. And Coach Grant and his staff, they have seen a cause and effect with the legalization of gambling and sports betting and the unbelievable vitriol his players get. You blow a lead against VCU and you don't cover the spread, you cannot believe what these coaches and players get online and social media, uh, all the way to death threats. Uh, Josh Myers told me one time that he has to turn his phone off every season, just shut his phone off because the, the, the awful poisonous anger that pours his way from Ohio State fans if he allows a sack back in that day is just it's just terrible I read that article and I know I know that this is good I read the article and I was ashamed that I'm a sports fan I, I it, was, it was just that oh my gosh what is wrong with us? But in that same newspaper was an article about a young woman this week who got into a fracas with the Dayton police because McDonald's didn't put extra cheese on her hamburger. And you know those stories are there, don't you? We hear stories of the barista at, at Starbucks didn't put, the, but put the, the sweetener in our mocha and we're upset about it and it just escalates. I don't know that there has been a time where this content from James is more relevant than it is today as James covers so many relevant issues, none more so than, look at verse 19 of chapter one again, my dear brothers and sisters, and, and he puts it so succinctly. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Why? Because human beings' anger does not produce the righteous life God desires. Notice the qualifier there. He's contrasting that with James' brother, Jesus. Jesus got angry, didn't he? He got angry at racism and manipulation and greed in the cleansing of the temple. That's what that was about. It was about racism. It was about poor people being taken advantage of by the religious leaders. He got angry at religion for religion's sake when he cursed the fig tree. And we know he got angry. But his anger was different from our anger. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now, every once in a while when we talk about this, every few years we do this little pop quiz. And it's, and it's done in jest, but it also has a side to it that I think is practical. So don't raise your hand, but just nod your head if, if one of these applies to you. When driving, how often do you use your horn? Number one, rarely if ever. You're just that placid person who goes down the highway, and if somebody crosses you, be absolved, my brother. I, I live in peace. Uh, number two, as needed, at least once a day. Uh, how many of you, it's like a vitamin for you. It's a one a day. It's, a, you know, if you, it's not a day if you don't use your horn. How about it? Number three, it is the most used part of my car is my horn. Oh, here's a big one. In a restaurant, how often do you complain about food? Never, 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 never. Your name should be Serena. You're so serene in a restaurant when they get your order wrong. Or number two, only if it's cold or there are too many bugs in it. Okay, that pushes me over the line. But some of you, number three, regularly, and I go out in my car and honk my horn until they get my order right. That was my dad. My dad was that way. He traveled a lot, ate at great restaurants, and I was always cringing when I was in a restaurant because he was so particular about his food in a restaurant. When you're waiting in a slow supermarket checkout line, what do you do? Maybe I meditate 
quietly and visualize world peace. Your, your name should be Gandhi and Kroger. Number two, I compare my line to the other lines next to me. How many of you do this? And you can handle it as long as you win. Have you ever noticed that? Like, I, I can handle it slow as long as my line wins. Or number three, I threaten anyone who looks like they are going to use coupons. <laughs> you know, one of the tricky things about anger is it's so useful in certain settings, isn't it? One of the things we understand about anger is anger is power. That's what it is. It's power. Uh, I've told this in Players Box many times that when I was a freshman in high school, we're sitting in our locker room, and my basketball coach is looking at our team, and he says, what, I want to ask you guys, what do you want out of basketball? When it came to me, I said, I want to play four years of college basketball. Now, at that point, I'm 5'6", 120 pounds. I am not a five-star recruit. And he went like this. He goes, right. And my reaction to that is an anger I have to deal with still to this day. Because that put a chip on my shoulder that became so useful in basketball. It was fuel for me. I never forgot that. Never forgot that. I tell, I tell players, I say, I was, I was a, a small college All-American. In my senior year, I was still going to prove something. That's how powerful anger can be. It can be an unbelievable fuel. Uh, my friend Ryan Wilhite was telling me yesterday, he said, he said Braden was in a player's box group a while back, and one of the kids in the group said, you know, Pastor Charlie seems like a pretty cool guy. I bet he'd be great to hang out with after church. And Braden said, well, he said, I was playing basketball against him one time, and there was a loose ball, and he checked me into a wall. He said, I think you'd be better off just looking at him as Pastor Charlie. Just keep it at that level. And, and for me, basketball, anger, controlled aggression was a fuel. I tell the story about one time Muhammad Ali told this, a great boxer. He said that when he was a little kid, he saved and saved and saved money because there's blue bike that he wanted. He just wanted this blue bike. And finally he got the blue bike. And just days later, some, some kid stole his blue bike. And he said, from that time on, whenever he'd step foot into a ring, he'd look across the ring before the bell rang, and he would say, that kid stole my blue bike. And that's a little bit of the trick with anger, isn't it? As you know, it is convenient. It is a convenient power to use. And it works, for example, in especially certain athletic endeavors. It, it's almost an essential that you have a controlled aggression but it doesn't work in life. It doesn't work in relationship. Jesus showed us that it's human to be angry. He got angry about racism. He got angry about abuse and extortion. But James says, that's not our anger, is it? Our anger is usually almost always about ourself, our hurt, our pride. And the damage of mismanaging anger is staggering, isn't it? Listen to these numbers. One violent crime every 22 seconds in our culture. One assault every 48 seconds. One murder every 23 minutes. According to Prism Magazine, domestic violence is the number one cause of emergency room visits by women. 1,500 people are killed every year by conflict escalating in traffic disputes. But you know, it's not just violence. Almost always, it, it divorces the result of mismanaged or unmanaged anger. And long before there was the legal separation, there was the emotional separation, wasn't it? Because of the unresolved nature of anger, it produces this barrier, produces this inhibition. And some people have lost their jobs because of anger problems. I remember watching a woman one time give her testimony, and she said, my boss, and she was talking about her recovery from anger issues and the wounding in her childhood she never dealt with. She said, my boss literally used to call me old faithful, not because I was reliable, because he knew I was going to blow up once a month. Once a month, I was just going to spew on him, and she said, it cost me my job. Now, most of us know that it's a problem. We've lost friends. We've lost relationships. We've become estranged. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, he said, every step of mismanaged anger is a step towards self-destruction and self-imprisonment. So let's look at this in three ways. Let's understand, let's acknowledge it. Let's understand it. And then let's talk about 
every day how we can process it. And I really do think it's something you have to do every day because anger is a secondary emotion. Always remember that. There is nothing wrong with anger. Anger is, is just like our physical pain mechanism. It is a sign that I perceive my sense of justice and my sense of worth have been violated. And so it's going to happen. No matter who you are, you're going to have moments where your system responds to a perception of violation. So that means, number one, we have to acknowledge it. Everybody falls prey to this at some time or another. And some of us, when we come to Christ, what we learn to do is we learn to cloak it under a veneer of religion. And we, we know we got to manage our anger. we got to control our anger. So we just bury it underneath. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And how that usually comes out is passive aggression, sarcasm, criticism, complaint, our anger trying to escape from a shrinking soul. That's what they are. As a matter of fact, Stephen Wright, the comedian, said, depression is anger without the enthusiasm. That's what it is. And it's so true that we can learn to cloak this, especially in a religious setting. A husband asked his wife, you know, she, he said, I've noticed when, when I get mad at you, you don't respond. Like, you don't get mad back. How do you do that? She said, well, I just, I've, I've learned. I just, I just go clean the bathtub. She said, well, he said, what does that have to do with being angry at me? She says, I use your toothbrush. And we like that, don't we? There's a part of us. How many of you like to watch shows where revenge is that dish best served cold? We love that because it's our sense of justice. And the sophisticated, morally acceptable way to express anger is, I'll just, I'll, I'll just ignore her. I'll just ignore him. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Are you sure something's wrong with you? If something's wrong, I'll tell you. And we think that's okay, but it's putting up barriers. And for some of us today... Uh, literally, your marriage depends on the truths that I'm going to say. You're literally, the future of your marriage depends on this. Probably the most succinct statement ever said about anger is in Ephesians 4 when the Apostle Paul says this. He says, in your anger, do not sin. In and of itself, anger is not a sin. It is a secondary emotion. It's a response of a violation. But within it, is where we can then venture in to getting way, 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 way out of bounds. And we start spewing that sideways. We start processing it with a colorless, odorless gas of, of, of just vitriol and complaint and criticism and sarcasm. So that means we have to understand it. One of the most basic truths about anger is that you have to be able to acknowledge what's its source. For example, as I'll say here later, I have a problem with technology. How many of you have a love-hate relationship with technology, but it's mostly hate? And so I, my dad was a brilliant engineer. He literally was a part in the 70s developing the Micro 68 processor. And, and so whenever I would try to help him do something, whatever it was, he had a way of making me feel stupid. There were, I just couldn't measure up to him. I've never been smart enough. And so when technology doesn't work, this morning, literally, because I changed my password on my Gmail account, I couldn't get my document to load onto my iPad, and I'm just starting to just like, oh, you feel stupid, you feel stupid, you feel stupid, you are stupid, you are stupid. And it starts feeding into that shame. But I now know that that's what that's about. I now know that my irrational response when technology doesn't work the way I want it to is going right back into under, an understanding that I now have that there's a, there's a wound there. There was a sense of violation. I don't think my father intended it, but it's reality. Now, here's some, here's some misconceptions about anger in our day that you need, to, you need to understand. And it'd be a good idea. Take a picture of these and talk about them with your family because these are common misunderstandings. Number one, my anger is caused by external events and other people. Technology is my problem. People are my problem. Well, uh, that inanimate object really doesn't care if you're angry or not. It's really not trying to get, the shoelaces that broke at the wrong time are really not trying to get a reaction from you. That ATM machine that swallowed your car, it, it, really, it really doesn't care. That elevator that you went, it's not going fast enough, and then 
because you know it's going to sense that you're in a hurry and you're angry and it's going to go faster. It really doesn't care if you're angry or not. And, and a lot of times we need to just acknowledge that stuff, things, and people are not our problem. People will say, we've said this, you've said it, you make me so mad. You make me so angry. And this is one of the basic understandings of anger that I know you're going to push back. If you have an anger problem, it's relative to how much you have an anger problem. You don't like this. No one makes you mad. You make you mad. And so let's stop. And it's just confession is good for the soul. At the count of three, I want you to say this out loud. Fake it till you make it. I make me so mad. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. I make me so mad. Some of you don't act like you believe it. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Ready? I make me so mad. Matter of fact, next time you're in an argument with someone and you feel your fight or flight mechanism kicking in, kick in, put your finger up and go, I make me so mad. Point the finger right back yourself because it's the truth. No one can make you mad because at the point between the violation and when your fight or flight adrenal mechanism kicks in and your heart rate goes, goes up and sugar is secreted into your bloodstream and you're preparing for action, between, there's, a, there's, a, there's a moment between that that is what psychologists call the psychological present. It's 2.1 seconds where you have the choice. You have a choice. You have a choice about how you're going to process your anger. Here's another one. I just can't control my anger. That's another misconception. I just can't control it. Well, there's a sense in which, remember this, remember this, every time you ventilate anger, what you're doing is you're creating these neural connections. Like every time you flood your brain and your front of your, your frontal lobe gets flooded with anger, you're creating these neural connections. Every time you do it, they start growing stronger, and then they grow stronger, and then they grow stronger. So in one sense, it is a vicious cycle that you've gotten yourself into. But it's a misconception that you can't control your anger. And we know that's true because how many times have you been in an argument in your house and that important phone call comes through, your phone buzzes, and you're going, ah, hello. You know that's true. You, you have had that happen where things are going hey, uh, hayward and you, you, just, you just know in an instant I got to control this. And so that's a misconception. Here's another one. The best way to handle anger is to ventilate it. And about 30 years ago, this was a really popular notion that anger is so destructive that you need to make sure that you just let it rip. That you ventilate your anger. It's not healthy. It'll build up in you like steam in a tea kettle, and you're just going to explode. One writer said this, said, why is it we think this about anger when we don't think this about other emotions? He said, I've been repressing joy for years, and I just have to let it go. I'm afraid if I don't let my joy go, I'm going to walk up to a total stranger and go, I'm so joyful. And they're going to wonder what's going on. He said, we, we never say this about gratitude. Friend, you got to get into touch with your gratitude. Let it go. Because when you're growing up, people did a lot of great things for you. And you never really have verbalized your gratitude. And it's bottled up inside of you. And you are a walking gratitude time bomb. You're about to go off and you're going to walk up to people you don't know. And you're just going to go, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We never say that about other emotions, do we? We don't. And it's not true about anger either. Anger doesn't drain out of you when you ventilate it it actually creates a neural connection that is even stronger. One of the baseline things we teach in player's box is your brain doesn't know the difference between yes and no. All it hears is emotion. And it creates those connections. And all of a sudden, as soon as a violation happens, boom, our brain goes right there to that neural connection. And we wonder why we struggle. This writer said the contemporary ventilationist view is to express your anger, let it fly so that it won't clog your arteries and ruin your relationships. But if you express your rage, if your expressed rage causes another person to shoot you, what will it matter that you die with very healthy arteries? And here's the problem about anger. How many of you who are ventilationists have ever liked to be the ventilatee? Nobody likes that. It just escalates the anger. You have somebody who pulls out in front of you, 
uh, on State Route 48 and you express your anger and they just pull up next to you and they say, you idiot, you, what, you shouldn't be driving a car. How many of you say, you know what? That is great wisdom. I'm going to be a better driver from now on. Thanks for sharing your viewpoint on this little infraction we had. It never happens that way, does it? What does it do? It just escalates it. And so the notion that what you do with anger is you just ventilate it, you let it rip, is a misconception. Here's another one. Taking or talking it out with a third party makes you less angry. Now this one, there's a truth to it and there's a non-truth to it. The non-truth is, is with you're angry at A, you go to B and you talk about it, that, that'll get it out. It doesn't. First of all, it kills relationships. It's called triangling. But the research shows that talking out an emotion to a third party doesn't reduce the emotion. It rehearses the emotion. This is why often if you go to B to talk about A, you're actually more angry when you leave that conversation than when you started it because all you just did is you embedded that anger deeper into your system. And so talking about your anger toward A to, with B, it doesn't reduce it, it rehearses it. Now here's the exception to that. This right here is why having skilled Christian counseling is so critical. Because I can't tell you how many times a Randy Creamer Paul Wilkins, so many of our trained pastoral counselors have said, hey, here's, here's how a conversation went with so-and-so, and they wanted you to know about this, and they've told me that they represented the party that wasn't there in the conversation at the moment, but was a part of the reason why there was anger, and the fact that they were able to talk about it but not have that validated actually led toward healing. This is why a, a, a pastoral counseling or a professional counseling context is so critical because you don't ventilate, you don't rehearse it. You actually get a mirror put up to your face about your condition. The problem isn't that person. The problem is, is you make you so angry. Here's another misconception right here. Never feeling angry is a sign of spiritual and emotional maturity. And this is one of the dangers if you're in a church setting that becomes very real, that I'll get to the point someday where I don't get angry. I'll get so, so close to Jesus that I won't get angry. One of my favorite movies, at least comedies, is What About Bob with Bill Murray. And if you remember the character, Dr. Leo Marvin, he is so mature. He is so in charge of his emotions. Is What does he say? I don't get angry, Kay. I don't get angry. And what does he end up doing at the end of the movie? He blows up his own house out of anger. And you'll never get to the point, unless you're not human, where you don't get angry, where you don't have a perception that you've been violated. And I say that's a perception, because it may not be true. But your perception is, is that your sense of justice and your sense of worth have been violated. Now, I had my freshman basketball coach tell me that, and that was in 1976. And I can remember that conversation almost word for word today when that poor excuse for a basketball coach said that toward me. Uh, no. Uh, I can still remember that. And that's why, this is why, this is why many of us, as our store employee said in the video, why many of us really do need to go back to some of those original wounds because the anger we're expressing toward that authority figure really are connected to this authority figure 45 years ago. How do you process your anger? Look what verse 19 says. James says you gotta, you, you gotta have a clear process and he says, take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And here's how you remember that verse. When you're feeling anger kick in, what I would tell you is stall, S-T-A-L-L. -L. It's an easy way to remember that verse. Get a mechanism, number one, of stopping. It is so critical that you acknowledge, that I acknowledge that psychological present of that 2.1 seconds where right in this moment, now I have a choice. I have a choice. If 
you ever see me on the front page of the paper, there's a really good chance it will be because I didn't do that. You say, how, how do you think, how do you think that you're, if you ever, if you ever fell in a scandal, what would it be from? I said, probably murder. Probably lashing out at someone where I just, I let my competitive nature get the best of me and it just did what Jesus said it'd do. He said, you, you'll get mad and then if you don't process it in a healthy way, he said, you end up in jail. Now, that was a figurative statement, but is it literal? It's literal sometimes, isn't it, Southbrook? And, and this is, I cannot tell you enough how important it is to have this mechanism. For me, it is breathing. Take how many breaths you, every, every breath you need. I saw someone a few weeks ago that I'm still really angry toward. And I didn't realize it until I saw that individual coming toward me. He's here right now. He's sitting. No, no. <laughs> And, I, and, I, and just for a minute, I, I, right in that moment, because usually you don't have much time, I had to, okay. Literally, that's my cue, to cue my brain into stop. Because I still feel a sense of vice. And especially for me, it was on behalf of my kids. And that's where it's really dangerous, isn't it? It's not you. It's the, the betrayal or the violation of your children. So learn to stop. Get in the habit. Use breathing as a mechanism. But that leads to number two, ask. Ask these questions. Why am I angry? Could I be wrong? What do I want? Why am I angry? Could I be wrong? What do I want? Because often our anger is a perception, but not a reality. We perceive that that person meant to violate our sense of worth. Sometimes this is not true. Number three, James says, be quick to listen. Commit to understanding other people by putting yourself in that person's place. And here's the trick on this. If you're in a discussion, one of the ways to stall the conversation, but also to activate listening, here's the magical phrase, you already know it. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. And it's amazing how often you'll start settling down when you ask the other person to, to share their viewpoint instead of what do we want to do? We want to interject our viewpoint into the conversation right now. But the tell me more mechanism is actually a little trick in your brain to say, I'm going to listen. And they may be wrong. But remember this. This is why Christians are so often the poorest processors of anger is you're more likely to mismanage anger when you're right. You're more likely to mismanage anger when you're out. I don't know how many of you know this, but today is National Right to Life Sunday. And, you know, abortion is a personal issue for me and my family. I had sisters who were told they needed to have an abortion by church people. And it's, it's, a, it's a really personal issue. But I always think it's incredulous that we seek to change something with anger that's about life. And... And I love it when we see peaceful demonstrations and, and loving confrontation. But when we mismanage our anger and we use hatred to try to get perception or legislation changed, we're undermining the very purpose of what we're trying to change. It is so critical to listen. And then number four, let it go. Let go. And this is what I want to do to end our time together today. It's why journaling the slights done to you, if you struggle with anger, it's a good idea to journal the slights done to you every day. Why? Paul said, in your anger, don't sin, and don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That is, that is such great advice because once anger has an overnight processing to it, it becomes more poisonous, it becomes more embedded into our system, it affects our sleep. And so one of the most important things you can do is every day you process that out and you lay it at the one entity that melts the power of anger. It's the grace of Christ. If you have an anger problem, we're going to have a pastor up here who can direct you to pastoral counseling after we're done. But one thing you can do before you leave here today is go to the sides of the room 
Grab the symbols of the body and blood of Christ given for you. Remember that he said these words that changed history. These words changed history. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Those words changed history because of the five things the early church was known about, the, 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 the most pronounced reality of the early church that changed Rome was they never retaliated when wronged, but when crucified or hung in effigy or hung uh, by a cross themselves, they said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They didn't retaliate. And that you say today, you take your hurt today and you, and you take those symbols and you say, Jesus, with, with this, melt my unresolved anger. Because he can. He can literally start, start melting that wound. And you still may need counseling. You probably do. But it starts at the cross. There's an old hymn that says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. And I, as, as an angry person, a shame-based person in recovery, I can tell you this is the truth. That every day I got to lay the offenses my way at the foot of the cross where he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I want you to do that today. Because probably the worst thing that can happen in a culture that is ready to spew anger at the drop of a pen is for Christians to be angry, for Christians to be vitriolic, for Christians to be retaliatory. And we got to be more gracious than that, don't we? So I'm going to pray, and it's up to you to lay your wounds down. Lay them at the foot of the cross. And if you need to talk to someone today, we're going to have a pastor up here to do just that. And they'll direct you in the direction you need to go. Let's pray first. Father, such simple words from James. My brothers and sisters, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. It's so hard because our systems are wired for fight or flight. And so our very systems are often working against us. And in a culture that feeds on that anger and fear, call us to another way. Call us in a way that we rise above that through the power of your grace. And we don't rehearse anger we learn to process it in the context of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for today. Thank you that in spite of the snow, maybe somebody here really needed to make it today and needed to be here for this. Probably so. Give us safety on our rides home. And it'd be great if the Bengals won today. And Jesus, we prayed, and everybody said, amen. amen.